Jerry, welcome to Short Story Long. I am really excited to have this conversation. Hmm. Well, thank you for having me, Chris. It's, it's really an honor to be here. It's a delight. Of course. So I, I mean, this is so cool because my, this is how this went down for the listener. I, our very good friend, Michael Katz was in town. We were having a conversation. I was asking if, asking him if he's ever done uh, therapy or business coaching or anything like that. He said his whole life, he would have thought that he would have told me that stuff was stupid up until <laughs> very, very recently. He read your book, he got connected with you, and it changed his entire perspective. And he's a very successful guy. Uh, it changed his entire perspective on all of those topics. And so, of course, being that I respect him so much, I grabbed the book right away that day on Amazon, read it, and then he, to my surprise, he connected us, and here we are. So this is a real, real... This is why I always say I'm so lucky to have this show and this platform that I've built because I'm able to read a book, be so impacted by it, and then a week later, I get to ask you all these little questions about it. I'm so lucky. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I feel lucky as well. Yeah, I feel, cool. I feel uh, you know, really moved that you had such a powerful response to the book. So I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah, I did big time. Um, so to get into it, can you quickly give me like, a, give me a quick rundown of the story of how you even got to, to what you do now, and then we'll get into what you do now. But how'd you get here? Yeah, so probably, you know, I mean, I, I like a lot of folks, I, I wandered through uh, my 20s with, with a number of different careers and trajectories. I mean, I was a reporter, I was an editor of a magazine, but um, probably the most relevant piece here is that I was a former venture capitalist. So in the first iteration of the web, um, uh, I was one of the leading investors in uh, backing the first companies that were trying to establish businesses using an, the internet as a medium uh, for communication and for commerce and kind of invented a lot of that stuff. I, I like to joke um, that I invented the internet because I didn't want to go shopping. Yeah. I really yeah. hate shopping. <laughs> yep. um, and then uh, somewhere in my mid thirties, I started having a uh, massive depression and, um, and really starting to question everything about my life. And so by age 38, I walked away from uh, a very successful career as a, an investor um, and began to rebuild myself, reboot myself, if you will, but really reinvent myself. And I came out of that period uh, first as a solo entrepreneur coach working primarily with people who just felt lost in one way or another and then eventually built a business and now we have a company and we're in different locations and that sort of thing so so that's the short story yeah amazing and i and that's all in the book and i i the thing that i think blew me away the most is you know i think entrepreneurship is really cool right now and i think that even venture capital has this new found mm -hmm cool factor with young people and i yeah. think to read that you were you know 38 so successful in in venture capital and at this like rock bottom moment i mean you said in the book that you even had like suicidal type moments yeah i mean i tell i tell the story of being uh 38 and uh, my second venture capital firm flatiron partners which I launched in 1996 with my partner, Fred Wilson. Um, that had sort of uh, had to migrate and transform because of the f collapse of the internet, um, the, the stock market and what was happening in 2000, 2001. And I had moved over to JP Morgan and I was uh, part of a $23 billion investment fund. And I was one of the lead partners focusing on technology. So, it was a it was a premier position I was in, yeah. Um, but the problem was that no matter how much approbation and affirmation I was getting from the world, no matter how much perception of success people were projecting onto me, um, I was hollow and empty inside. And um, you know, the more 
praise I got, the more shitty I felt about myself. Yeah. Uh, because the two didn't match. Yeah. Until finally one day, February 2nd, uh, 2002, I stood outside uh, Ground Zero, uh, which was the, the, the rubble that had been with the World Trade Center. Yeah. And uh, really had to decide if I was going to give in to the impulse to jump in front of a train, a subway train, or um, call my therapist. And fortunately, I called my therapist. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Um, what would you say? I don't want this question to blow like ten of my later questions. But like, what <laughs> would you? What would you say at the core was the reason that you were so successful and felt so hollow? Was it a lack of connection to a purpose? Was it because everyone? Mm. I mean, once again, we've heard this story. Mm. We've heard, not this story, we've heard so many times, money doesn't buy happiness, money can't, whatever, and everyone kind of pushes back and says, yeah, well, you know, that's easy for you to say you have so much money. It's like, I really want people to understand mm. what it feels like to have all of that success, have everyone telling you you're so successful, but something's lacking. Like, could you know, what? could well, you explain what it I, was that was like? Well, well, Chris, I, I don't. There's no way you can ask me that question without just checking in with your own self. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Well, I know. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to because this is the thing. I've never found a good way to say it. So I've been on podcasts and stuff before, and I've said, "Hey, listen, trust mm. me. Money does not make you happy." Mm. But I, I think that people who don't currently have success mm. kind of write that off instantly. Right. And they don't often connect to the person. You know what I'm saying? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I do. I do. I do. And and I just wanted to to land the conversation between us because I I can just feel that this isn't just a question that's some sort of academic question. This is a question that's coming from your own heart. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to acknowledge that. So here's the way I would respond to the question. What what I often say is that the inside of me wasn't matching the outside of me. Mm -hmm. Now, people can relate to that because, because they know when they're walking around feeling like they're living a lie, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, you know, there's a psychological term, disassociation, that kicks in, which is when you're just kind of like having an out-of-body experience and not a good one, yeah. right? Where you're walking around and there's like this shell of a human who has your avatar, right, or is your avatar. And inside, you might be dying, mm -hmm. right? And so, but I think, so that's what it felt like to me. I think the question, though, that you're asking is, well, how did that come about, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's perfectly possible, let's be clear, it's perfectly possible to have money and be happy. Yep. Right? Of course, of course. So that's not for me, and I don't know if this is true for you or for other people who've found themselves in similar say, situation, but I'll say for me, the breakthrough understanding came about when I came to understand that my pursuit for money was a pursuit for safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that it was really linked back to my childhood. And so I tell this story of, growing up in an enormous amount of chaos and a pervasive sense of poverty and shame. And that the relief I felt came about, what relief I got came about when I went to visit my grandparents, my mother's parents. Yeah. And Grandpa Guido was, uh, you know, had a sixth grade education and ran an ice business in the 1940s and 1950s in Brooklyn. Later, he was working for an uncle of mine in a restaurant. But the important thing was he always seemed to have enough, mm -hmm. unlike my home. And symbolically, I latched onto this notion of lemon drops, which, you know, in grandma and grandpa's house, they always had this green pantry, or they had this green pantry outside their kitchen. And in the green pantry was always a canister, a tin of lemon drops. And I associated having enough, being safe, being able to be calm and have enough food and all of those things with lemon drops. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and lemon drops became money. And so when I realized that I was depleting myself and running myself into the ground, it was in the pursuit of safety. It was in a pursuit of the feeling that I would get when I would go to visit my grandparents' house. Um, and then I realized that I had the money that was that should have made me feel safe. Yep. And I wasn't feeling safe. And can I ask you too, was the feeling from your grandparents' house more just a feeling? I mean, they weren't rich. They didn't have money flying yeah. all over the place, right? That was just, they just for somehow gave off that feeling of that they had enough? Well, you know, you're the, you're, of all the conversations I've done, you're the first person to ask about that. That's great. And, and um, yes, they didn't have a lot of money. Got it. Got it. But what they had was calm. What they had was a sense of nurturing. And even now, I can, I, you know, my grandmother grew roses in the backyard of their house in Brooklyn. 2906 Beverly Road, Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. And there was a fig tree that was started as a, a, as a cutting brought over from Italy when they emigrated. And um, there just seemed to be in their household just such a lack of chaos mm -hmm. that, um, to my mind, they were the wealthiest people I know. Now, it's also true that my grandfather was wise enough early on in his life that whenever he got a little extra money, he sunk it into real estate in Brooklyn. Yep. So he owned like three or four buildings in Brooklyn, including the place, the home that we lived in. Got it. Got it. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm, that's amazing. And, and also, I just want to like take a second to be super transparent of why some of these questions feel like and why I relate to the this part of your story so much is because for me personally I had a lot of success very early on and you know made uh over a million dollars probably for the first time when I was 25 mm -hmm. right and so very early success and very not prepared for how to handle all of the new challenges that come with that so for me at around 28 29 I had a very similar feeling to what you describe at 38, where it just felt very empty and very terrible. And I did feel like I was also doing something similar. I, I, I can really relate to that feeling of living in another body. For me, success and money was more like um, uh, looking for like respect almost, or, or mm -hmm. you know, like I was a younger brother. And I think mm -hmm. that part of that was that hunger drove me to become successful, but also I never felt like I meant anything or, or, or sort of mattered. Right. And so I felt like I was always projecting this idea of a successful young person that must be this just prodigy and, and there was no end to it. And so I ended up feeling at 28, 29, very, very, very empty and lost and not good. So I also did another, uh, similar to you, I went on a mini you know, little journey and read a bunch and educated myself and kind of got rid of all the extra fancy things. And now at 32, feel better than I ever have in my life, but I'm still very much on this, you know, now that I've seen mm. you can learn and grow and solve problems, I'm starving for new mm. ways to look at things. And that's why your book resonated so heavily with me, because even after the last few years of real exploration, it was a new way and a new connection to that ongoing journey of mine. Mm. So just so we, you know what I mean? We kind of bond I do, on I that. I do, and, and I really appreciate your sharing uh, the truth of your story. And I just want to circle back to something you said, which was how empty you felt. Yeah. I time. mean, that's the word, isn't it, man? Oh, big time. And it makes no sense, and nobody feels bad for you. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's so painful. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not true for everybody, and we acknowledge that. And some people don't experience the discordant feelings around this. And by the way, you don't have to have this complicated relationship with money to have these feelings of striving to be seen, because I heard that in your story, yep. striving to be, to be respected, striving to matter, yep. right? You know, I often talk about this notion of us all being wired for the pursuit of love, safety, and belonging. Yep. 
And I hear all three in your wish to matter. Big time. Right. Big time. And I, for me, like I had, you know, my parents are still together. They're so loving. Like I said, I had this early success. I moved from Ohio to LA. I, it's like there was no way for me to even logically explain to the to anyone next to me why I should be upset. But it's crazy and, and amazing to me. And it really gave me a lot of empathy for other people that something so small as your perspective on, like I said, mine, I, I believe, is little brother syndrome or, or, mm -hmm. or something similar. Mm -hmm. um, such a little thing as you get older without it properly being explored and looked into can become something very bad and very dark. And I never had anything to fall back on and say, oh, I had a bad childhood. Oh, I had this. I had, I never had any, you know what I mean? And, and yeah, that was I very do. confusing for me. I do. You know, um, it's like, I think the, the process of becoming fully human, mm -hmm. um, you know, human beings have a long gestation period, nine months in the womb. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, it's, it's pretty well documented that our development um, takes years, right? Decades. Yep. Um, and then there's this other process, right, that has to occur. And um, the uh, what I'm hearing in your story is that there was a little bit of a forced um, gestation period for you. You know, at 22, to be thrust into the world in a particular way, and it doesn't sound like you were ready. You weren't fully formed. Yeah, not at all. You know, yep. there's a there, one of my favorite novels is uh, is by a Greek writer named Nikos Kazantzakis, and uh, it's called Zorba the Greek. And a lot of people know the movie, but the the novel is even more important and powerful. And in the story, Zorba tell in the novel, uh, Zorba tells the story of uh, coming across a cocoon um, hanging in a tree, and uh, he's so excited as a boy. He's so excited at seeing this that he can't wait for the butterfly to emerge. So he blows on it, mm -hmm. and the cocoon starts to gestate and evolve, and the butterfly starts to come out and it starts to unfold its wings, and then within seconds it dies. Yep. Because it wasn't ready. Yep. And there is a little bit of that, perhaps, that happened. Yeah, big time. Big time. Yeah. Um, so for you, at if 38 was kind of the the bottom or this big moment that happened at, at ground zero, did how long did it take you to start to connect the dots and to feel like you knew where you were headed? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, so if we go back to that moment where I'm deciding whether or not I'm going to live or die, yeah. and we talk about that as a kind of ground zero moment for me, um, from that point till about three or four years later, got it. I was kind of through it, but um, you know, it didn't. It wasn't straight. And up and to the right, it wasn't, you know, just this happens and this happens. It, there was a hell of a lot of wandering during that period yep. and a lot of backsliding and being unsure of what was happening for me. And, you know, to, to our point earlier about our mutual friend Michael's reaction to therapy, had it not been for the woman, uh, the therapist that I was seeing at the time, um, I don't know that I would have made it. So would you say therapy was step one that started this whole journey? You know, there's always like that one book or that one friend. Or For you, was it therapy that was the first step in this whole new path? Well, I to be clear, I'd been in therapy before. I'd, um, I'd been in therapy in my 20s, and I'd been working with this particular doctor, Dr. Sayers, um, mm -hmm. for a number of years before this moment had come about. But what I would often say is that I spent the first few years in therapy bullshitting. Yep. yep. That was for sure. And I got really good at bullshitting and being a good patient, but not actually making any progress and not actually talking about the real stuff that was really bothering me. Yep. Um, I can't put my finger in any one thing. 
um, as much as I might like to promote the notion of people seeking professional help, um, it was a lot of things. Like you, I read voraciously. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there were three books that were incredibly meaningful to me. Um, when Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron, Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer, and Faith by Sharon Salzberg, the Buddhist teacher. Yeah. Um, so what was the most instrumental or something? I'm not sure, but it was kind of, I would say this, I'll give myself the credit. It was the commitment to not bullshit anymore. Yeah, that's huge. Um, okay, and then sort of fast forwarding, once again for the listener, can you explain what you do now? What does it look like? I know you, you know, I want to kind of paint this picture of, okay, this is where you came from. You had this moment, this kind mm -hmm. of worked on yourself, and now you are dedicated to what? I know you do boot camps. I know you work with, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, tell us. Yeah, so, so, as a coach, so I'm not a therapist, mm -hmm. although I may sound like one on podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, as a coach, I work in a realm where how we uh, define ourselves with our work comes up against who we are as people, yeah. right? I have this sort of fundamental belief that um, that to be a better leader requires that we be a better human. Yep. Which means, again, that we stop bullshitting ourselves and that we confront the reality of who we are. Um, and so we actually have a whole company that's focused on this. And we primarily work with um, first-time leaders, but um, increasingly that's expanding even, even beyond that. And so what does it look like? What does it sound like? It, it, you know, it's not a therapy session. Mm -hmm. Um and the coach's best tools are good questions. Um, and the experiences are very much like one-on-one -on -one sessions yeah. where you're having a conversation. And the client may walk in and say, I, I, I hate my job. Yeah. And I need to make a change. And we start to have a conversation about why they took the job in the first place. Yeah. And what was really going on for them there. So. And that's what I think is so, like, I don't know. I mean, like I said, starting about four years ago, I read, I've read about a book a week mm -hmm. for the last four years because just I've gotten so much from it. Mm -hmm. And never thought I'd say that, didn't grow up reading any of that stuff. And I probably said that a hundred times on this podcast. <laughs> so for my listeners, I apologize. I'm not bragging. My point is I've never read a book that combined a lot of the thoughts and, and styles of therapy with being a leader and sort of business. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, I don't know, it just, it seems to me like, you know what it felt like for me as a guy who right. runs a business and who is responsible for a lot of people and feels a, feels a, um, a need to be tough and sure and solid. Mm -hmm. It, it sort of opened up this whole lane of, well, like I said, this sort of therapy angle to it all. And sort of that the way that the things that you're dealing with as a person is going to affect directly how you lead those people and how solid you really are and how sure you really are and confident you really are. Did you, like, is this, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, this naturally just came up as drawing these connections between childhood thoughts about money and mm. the stories that we've told ourselves and how, like, how were you able to so clearly point out something that no one else has done so clearly? It, to me, <laughs> yeah, I, wish I know that you probably don't want to take credit for that, but well, from my perspective. Uh, uh, well, I'll give myself this credit. Um, mm. I, uh, well, first of all, like you, I read constantly, voraciously. Mm -hmm. um, reading saved my life. No question. And that goes back to childhood. Yeah. But um, I will give myself the credit for seeing connections and being able to make those associations that others have not necessarily made before or haven't done it in the way that I've done it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's particularly better than someone else's point of view. It's just different. So I, I often think that... Um, what I'm doing is combining a kind of 
very pragmatic, on the ground, understanding of the way organizations operate, startups grow, um, large organizations function, the way human beings operate in collectives. I combine that with um, a kind of psychological awareness, philosophical awareness, and then a bit of Buddhism thrown in for good measure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing is, Chris, I'm not sure why I see those connections as quickly as I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, And for me, like I often joke, like I'll hear a Buddhist tale um, and I see immediately its applicability in business. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm able to make that connection. And, and, uh, I think if there's something that's different about the book, it's, it's a willingness to combine those different realms and maybe even a little bit of poetry here and there to, to really mix things up. Um, uh, I think that's what I tried to do. Yeah. You do it incredibly. I I just feel like through my journey, I've sort of read, you know, the more spiritual type books and then I've read the business books and I have been like, okay, well, there's there's kind of one common truth here, but I've never read them both in one book and that's what yeah. you did brilliantly. Well, thank you. That's, that's, that's a big compliment to me because I think that we live our lives a little too bifurcated and a little too compartmentalized. Yep. I think the whole notion of work and life being separate is kind of bullshit. Yep. And I, I think and I think that we are humans first and foremost, and I think that we need to work together to as human beings. Yep. So, um, okay, here's another one. I, I, you know, a lot of times when people hear leader or CEO or, or or that sort of thing, they think, okay, well, that person's job is to, you know, figure out the mechanics of the business, uh, drive revenue, make shareholders happy if that's your thing, or investors or whatever it is. That's the role of a leader. What would you say the true role of a leader is? Well, let's talk about that first vision first. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there are times when the person who holds power needs to make a quick, fast judgment call and just decide. Yep. Oftentimes it's at the start of an organization. Oftentimes, like I'll, I'll joke, you know, it's like when someone has to identify that there's a fire in the room, you know, fire quick, everybody get out of the room, yeah. right? That is um, a really important role to play. But if we go back and we start to examine why do leaders hate their jobs so much and why do they feel depleted and why do they feel, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times a client will get on the phone with me and they'll say, why can't my staff make any decision without me? Yep. And I'll say, well, because we set up an organization such that all decisions have to flow through you. Yep. Right. And so if we take a step back and we start to reassign the task of leadership as creating the conditions by which great people get to do the best work of their lives, all of a sudden the leader's job becomes not trying to have perfect knowledge, which is impossible, about the present and the future. Perfect knowledge. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. But the job then becomes, oh, wait, I have to remove obstacles from good people? I have to attract and retain really great people? Okay, I can do that. And then I have to get stuff out of their way so that they can do great job, great work? Okay, well, that's a different job. Yeah, big time. And one thing I also want to say is like, I think that I just, for the listener, you know, I know that we're saying leader a lot and I don't want anyone to be listening to this and think, well, I'm not a leader. I just have a job. I'm just a, you know, whatever. And so this isn't for me. One thing I would say is if you, I wish I would have read these types of books when I wasn't a leader, because Mm -hmm. if I had someone even low level in my company who acted even partially this way. Mm -hmm. they would be promoted so quickly you'd become, you know what I mean? It's like, Mm -hmm. there's so much core foundational sort of knowledge here for anyone in any workforce, whether you're leading or you're trying to become a leader one day that I just think is so important and so important to hopefully learn before you become a CEO. um, Mm -hmm. And that's how you get there. Yeah. You know, um, I get a lot of the, uh, a lot of folks have to ask the question about, leadership and, you know, what if I'm not a leader and, you know, what, what, what are the messages for me? And 
I go back to this this construct that I have, which is that better humans make better leaders. Yeah. And um, we're all humans. Yeah. And if we can do the work uh, on ourselves to to grow, and you know, the subtitle of the book is Leadership and the Art of Growing Up. So if we can do the work necessary to grow up and to become fully actualized as, as human beings, as adults, well, then we'll lead better for sure. Yeah. But I think we'll also live better. And yeah. that's, you know, the secret, Chris, I care about people leading well, but I care much more about them living well. Because yeah. I don't want people to feel what I felt when I was 38. Or what you may have felt at 28. Yep. I don't want people feeling spent, burnt out, depleted, questioning whether or not life is better without them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's back to that, you know, the life and work being the that's same right. thing. You know? That's right. That's right. Um, let me ask you this. I love, once again, the way that you put the idea of ghosts in the machine. Mm. Can you explain to us what that means, where the reference comes from, and how we can all maybe take a second to look if we've maybe got some ghosts acting up in our machines? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a term that I've heard some de software developers use over time, and it often refers to old code, old programming, yeah. old belief systems that we grew up with um, that sort of haunt us and uh, kind of hang around long after their usefulness. Um, a, a few weeks ago, I was uh, doing a public talk with um, a client friend of mine, and uh, we were talking about his relationship with money. And uh, there was this brilliant moment where he said, um, he said, uh, I had an idyllic childhood. We had no problems with money. And I said, well, that's, that's great. And we were talking about the fact that he's pursuing multiple jobs simultaneously. He's always has more than one job going on. And so, you know, we're, we're talking in public and he makes a joke about how idyllic his childhood was. And then he turns around and he says, of course, my parents didn't turn the heat on in winter. Mm -hmm. And everybody looks at him and I said, well, what did they do for a living? He said, well, they were both doctors. They were upper middle class and the town was in New England. And so I paused and I said, well, why didn't they turn the heat on? I said, well, they didn't want to waste money. I said, well, did they have money? Yeah. So well, where did they learn not to waste money? And he's like, I don't know. And then he pauses and he looks at me and he says, maybe it had something to do with my grandfather losing his fortune and killing himself. Sheesh. That's a ghost in the machine. Right. He was so far removed from that experience that it wasn't even in his consciousness that perhaps the reason he worked not one, not two, but three jobs was because of what happened to his grandfather. And is the way that that manifested itself in him was he was he was miserable. He was overworking himself, overworking himself and didn't know why and did not know why. Gosh. And 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 could not understand what he was so afraid of to the point where, you know, his, his wife was like, you know, what are you doing? This, this is hurting us. Yep. You have enough. Right. And so we grow up with a sensibility that we don't have enough and that can be two generations back, but it becomes a belief system. It becomes what I often say. It becomes like a truth about the world. This is the way the world just is. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I, you know. Uh, you know. You look. You look at uh, loss. You look at trauma um, in previous generations, and it can and it can point to enormous behavioral issues. Um, uh, you know, I know of a client who whose organization struggles with trust within the organization. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I love getting called in for trust related issues. The first question I often ask people is, well, are you telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And they laugh. It's like, no, well, we're protecting each other. From what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. They don't question that. They just parse and compartmentalize things to protect each other yep. only to turn around 
and start to wonder why they don't trust each other. That's fascinating. I, when I reached that point in my life where I realized that concept, the idea of ghosts in the machine or these sort of stories or whatever, it's, mm. and it's still something that I feel like I, I work on daily, but it's such a mind-blowing sort of experience because I feel like most people sort of just go through life and they think they're kind of 100% in control and they think they see mm. reality objectively and mm. things just happen to them and maybe patterns keep repeating and, well, the world's unfair or these people are just this or my my company's all losers or the, you know what I mean? And, and yeah, it's yeah. just sort of I mean, how I, we live. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the, the, the phrase that drives me crazy goes like this. It is what it is. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. no, it's not, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, um, uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, you know, the process that I, 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 I coined a term uh, to describe this called radical self inquiry. And to me, Radical self-inquiry is simply the process of calling these things into question. Yep. Right? Do you, why do you believe that the world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world? Right? If I don't get mine before you get yours, then, well, where did that come from? Yeah. Yep. Right? Because not everybody believes that. Yeah. That's great. Uh, this is the other thing that I love is I, you, so let's say we start to, figure that out. We start to dig mm. out these ghosts in our machine. And then you literally have a section called choosing to become me. Mm. And you use the Carl Jung quote that I love. That's um, I'm not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Mm -hmm. So my question is, let's just say now we've realized that we've, we've started to dig out these ghosts. How do we go about, well, who are we now? If we're not these stories, Mm. If we're now, oh my gosh, now it almost seems kind of scary because you mean to tell me that was all stories, and so who am I now, Jerry? Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah. do I do now? <laughs> what, now? I'm nothing. Yeah. So yeah. what do I do now? <laughs> that, that's the moment that I often refer to where I turn the snow globe of your mind upside yeah. down. <laughs> yeah. It's like you just wiped all the pages of my book, and I'm like, all right, man, whatever you say. <laughs> right. Um, so I turn to Buddhism for the answer there. Yep which is the pathless path. And it's hard. You said something, you said something very quickly just now. You said something like, um, something like it hurts or it's hard or it's difficult. It's yeah. like, yeah. Choosing to become me, choosing to be me. First of all, um, well, the process is really hard. Because it requires that you actually understand who you are. Yeah. Um, but implicit in that statement is something really powerful. It's the statement of your own agency. Because it acknowledges that you actually do have a choice. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's also buried within that Carl Jung quote, which is the notion that I choose how I would like to live my life. Yep. That's, that's where it's for it me. Radical. That's yeah. it. For me, that's where all the excitement of life lives. That's right. In the choose part. That's right. What what a what a brilliant and life affirming counterexample to the emptiness that we were describing just before. Yeah, you're right. You're right. right? And so so when you resonate with that, Chris, when you resonate with when when you resonate with, with that section, what that's telling me is that the inner and outer parts of you, of you are now in alignment. Now, the work that lays before you is still hard. Yep. It's the pathless path. It's, I have to figure this out for myself? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, is that hard. Yep. But the reward is so worth it. And the reward, remember, if we go back to the whole relationship with money, where we, say, where we say, like, for me, I was pursuing money to feel safety. You were pursuing a sense of belonging, perhaps, yep. right? And so once you get to that point where you're choosing yourself, where you're choosing to become yourself, where you're in that, that landscape of this is who I am, this is the adult I choose to be, well... Belonging is something that is just part and parcel to who you are yep. because you belong everywhere then. Yep. Yeah, that's to me, that's where the core of all the, and, and the way I always describe it is like, either way, 
life's uh, hard, for lack of a better way to say it, mm-hmm. right? Life's hard. It is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's really hard. I mean, the Amazon is burning and the Arctic is burning. Life is hard. A hundred percent. And that's where I think like, okay, we can start there, right? Life is hard. So that's just sort of the first truth. But the way right. I see it is I would rather, to me, there's two types of sort of struggle. And one is taking what the world throws on you, not quite sure of why you're getting it, maybe feeling that same disconnect that we both relate to. Things mm. don't make sense. I'm just taking, I'm just getting hit by life. Mm. Mm. The other way is this hard struggle of that lives in that choose moment. Mm. And it's that every day you're struggling to sort of find out who you are, become who you are rather. Mm-hmm. Uh, either way, they're both hard. Neither of them's easy. But I kind of equate it to how it feels like in the gym. You can either sit around and deal with all the health problems that are coming your way, or you can get your butt kicked in the gym every day. But at least you're in control of the pain moving towards a destination as opposed to just receiving an on never-ending onslaught of pain. Does that Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. And, and I'm smiling because I'm remembering, I, I, I think you remember uh, the story of Ben Saunders, my, my client, yep. the polar explorer. Yep, and yep. uh you know to 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 put some context to it Ben and his partner uh Tarka set a record uh they they uh skied from the edge of Antarctica to the south pole and back okay to put that in perspective that's 1800 mile round trip okay in 4 months at 50 below zero okay carrying most of their supplies with them along the way Mm-hmm. And every two or three days, we would do a coaching session by satellite phone. And I remember Ben would get on the phone and he would just whine. He would just <laughs> whine. Yeah. And I remember one time he was like, but Jerry, you don't understand how hard it is. And I'm like, dude, you're trying to do something no human being has ever done before. Yeah. Of course it's hard. <laughs> right? If yeah. you wanted easy, you'd stay home in the UK. Yep. Yep. Right? And, you know... Yeah, it's hard. And I don't mean to make light of the fact that it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. But it's also wonderful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you, speaking of you, Chris, have built a company now. So you didn't have sudden wealth syndrome. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, all of a sudden, you went from, you know, a kid to an adult with more money than you ever had before, probably more money than your parents ever had. Yep. Now you've actually built something. And all those people who might drive you crazy at times, well, you can look with pride and say, look what we did. Yep. That's powerful. Yep. And exactly. that's, what, that's what makes that hard worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, so true. Um. The other thing that you said that is a part of the book that I just love and once again connected to so much and, and had not been hit with it this clear um, in any of the stuff that I'd read is I felt for a long time. So once again, um, part of, I think, kind of jumping in the game young mm-hmm. um, was, you know, I didn't go to college. I didn't do that stuff. And so I always felt a little uh, out of my league mm-hmm. and as I, you know, in the beginning, I think I liked that because I felt like, oh, yeah, look what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm going to change the game. And, and then stuff gets real and you're like, oh, man, I wish I would have learned that. And for a while, I wished I had went to Harvard Business School. And I was so envious of people who did that. And I wish I had more of an education. I wish whatever. I think that I lived for a very, very, very long time. And I'm still trying to remind myself that this is true, mm. thinking that there is an answer. There is mm. a map. There is a blueprint. And mm. other people have it, but I don't. Mm. And I think when you talk about the job of living in the not knowing, mm. and that is the actual thing in the pathless path, like you said, and that's the game, mm. I think made me feel so like, I don't know, it made me feel so like included. It made me feel so like, mm. oh, so you're telling me I'm already playing the game? I thought... <laughs> one day, uh, you know, some book was going to land and I was going to know everything that everyone, every other business owner knows. You know what I mean? Does that make yeah, sense? I, 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 do, I know precisely what you mean. Um, first, the first thing I was going to say is I relate to the feelings because while I did go to college, I went to Queens College, City, of, City University of New York. Yeah. Right. 
Um, it, it is the CUNY for a hundred years <clears throat> has been the school system for the city's working poor. Yeah. And, um, despite all of its great academics, it was still the place, <clears throat> you know, when I landed in, you know, at JP Morgan, I was surrounded by people who had gone to Ivy League schools yeah. and I didn't have that. And so that same sense of shame, that same sense of not good enough was there for me. Yeah. But in addition was this sensibility that somehow someone's got a playbook out there that they're just hiding from me. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, <clears throat> one of the gifts of being a coach is the realization that everybody's walking around with the belief system that there's a playbook that's been hidden from them, including the people who went to Harvard Business School. Yep. Yep. And the reason that they're feeling that way is because it's really hard and complicated. And there is this um, myth that if you just uh, make all the right choices, just make all the right choices yep. and go to the right schools, and get the right A's that you'll not suffer. Yep. yep. And that just isn't true. Yep. And it's that, you know, as hard as it might have been for you, Chris, um, in my experience, it's even harder for the people who have done it all right yep. by society's standards. And then they wake up in their mid thirties and they are shocked by the reality that even though they played the game, right they're still suffering yeah yeah that's the part that like as i've started to grow out of that mm -hmm. has actually become so empowering because mm -hmm. now i act much more from a place of i never had mm -hmm. I, i've always been resourceful i moved mm -hmm. out here from ohio on my own i've always figured it out i got you know like and that sort of has given me confidence in not knowing um, and now i feel just like you said, I, I feel I've talked to people who have done all the right things and and they're more lost than anyone or maybe they don't have the sort of street smarts that it takes or those sort of things. And it's like, man, the system failed those people is how they feel. And yeah, that's yeah. a way deeper. That's right. You know that's, what I mean? I do. I do. And, and you know, you, you, you said the system failed those people. The system, whatever that means, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is kind of rigged against all of us. Right. If you grow up, grow up in, in less than idealized circumstances, you are socialized to believe you're less than. And if you grow up with privilege and power, you can be socialized to believe that uh, you're an imposter and a fraud. Yeah. And you're, it's just a matter of time until the whole house of cards comes crashing down. And so I think the right response is to just not play the game yep. and to not care. Yep. And the question for you, right? If you were my coaching client and I might say to you, how's the business doing? Cause that's the on the ground reality. Yeah, it's true. It's not. What do people think of my business that matters? Yeah, it's true. And for me to be honest, like if I'm being brutally honest here, it's like there was one period around that period that I talked about at 28 where business was very tough and it was because retail changed and mm -hmm. you know the whole industry changed that I had spent six years building up and kind of following the path of what you're supposed to do there. I would say that the actual, the actual trouble in business that came from the market changing was, mm -hmm. was pretty severe. But the damage I did by what I made that mean in my head was much more severe. Yeah. And had I been able to not play, you know, play the game without playing the game in that instance and take take that moment and be able to keep going completely unaffected, the impact of what actually happened would have been less. Right. Cuz now that I'm, you know, getting a little wiser, I look back at those financials. I did this the other day. I look back at the financials of the business through that time period. I'm like, "Ah, it wasn't that bad." You know, like it was tough. Right. And there was a lot of cuts and there was people we had to fire. And those are very hard conversations. But man, my own damage, the, my own stories, what I told myself through that time did a little extra damage. 
mm-hmm. on what was actually happening, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I do. But that's what I love about this idea, I think, should resonate with anyone out there that feels stuck or feels... I, I believe from the people that I've talked to and the stuff that I've, at least from my experience, that this fear, there's even a quote in the book that says, fear is the stumbling block leading to the sin of inaction. Mm -hmm. And that fear of not being equipped or not being as smart as the next guy, or I don't know, those people are different than me, or I can't handle it, is what I think stops most people from ever leaving step one and ever stepping into what they could be and always sort of living with that, you know, oh, I could have been more or screw that guy. He had it easier. Screw that girl. She didn't, you know what I mean? And yes. never being able to really live out who you could be and finding that fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and least we leave this conversation with just the belief that I'm somehow telling people, Oh, just push through the fear. Um, when you encounter that stumbling block, it is, um, a cause for inquiry. It's a, it's an opportunity. This is a lesson I learned from Buddhism. It's an opportunity to really understand what's behind the fear, right? And so, for example, um, if I'm working with a client whose fear of failure prevents them from taking a step that they need to take in their life, what we do is we stand shoulder to shoulder and we go to the back of the cave, if you will, and we look at the imagined worst possibility. And we sit there and we say, okay, what's going to happen? And when did you first start believing that if you fail, you're going to lose your father's love? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And once we start to understand that, we unpack that and we start to question the, the validity of that belief system that set in when you were five, six, ten years old. And then we alter it. And that then releases the grip of fear. You're still afraid, but you're not paralyzed by it. Yeah, gosh. Gosh, I love it so much. Mm -hmm. Um, And then right on that topic, because there's another quote I wrote down, I think was from the Gospel of St. Thomas. If you bring forth what is in you, what is in you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is in you, what is in you will destroy you. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the key, once again, the key ideas, right? What I hope people gain from really this podcast, but more importantly, your book is all the answers are in Mm -hmm. and, and, and the goal is to go inward. And I think that, you know, uh, right now it's also really popular to blame outward Mm -hmm. and it's really easy to, you know, be on social media or get all these news alerts on your phone and gosh, Mm. the world is so terrible and this isn't fair and look who our president is or look at this, look at that. Mm. And it's really easy to put all of the blame and all the focus outward. And I think everything that we're talking about today and a lot of what you talk about in the book is like, it's all all the progress, all the growth, all the fulfillment is from looking inward. Is that accurate? Yeah, let me me parse it a little bit more. Yeah, please, Uh, please. So um, there's a question I ask repeatedly in the book which is how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a powerful way to cut through what you're referring to as the externalization process. Why does this always happen to me? Okay. But I want to break down that question a little bit. I, I use the word complicit and not the word responsible purposefully. Complicit implies that there are other actors involved, right? So I have been complicit, but not responsible. Yeah, that's so important. Okay. In creating the conditions, and this is important, I say I don't want. I say I don't want to live my life where I'm depleting myself over and over again. Now, to go back to your analogy, where people are sort of looking at the world and blaming the world, you make a really important point, which is that the, the distinctions are the, the, or the resources are within. So the world kind of sucks, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I have been complicit in the suckiness of the world. Yep. That is true, okay? And sometimes other people are responsible for it. That is true. Yep. 
But the resources I have to withstand the world and all of its harshness actually lie within me. Yep. And how I change myself in response to that harsh world, well, that's the becoming me part. That's the how I respond to the world. And so just, just to go back to it, the distinction is I am not responsible. Just, just because I'm no longer seeing everyone else as responsible doesn't mean I am now guiltily responsible for everything. That's not what we're saying. Yeah. But what we are saying is I have the agency to achieve the kind of equanimity, the kind of peace of mind that I so fervently desire. Yeah. Yeah. I just... Another thing that fascinated me is like this idea of, once again, we'll go back to life is hard. And mm. at, at some point, there's a decision you have to make at some point of whether you need to try to fix this broken thing out there or fix yourself to deal with the fact that it's hard. Does that make sense? Yes. And for me, I think that was a big thing because once again, just to tie it into what's going on now, like it's real big to hashtag, you know, be hashtag outraged and hashtag cancel this and hashtag cancel. You know, it's like, you know that even though those people aren't getting out and holding signs and marching or really doing anything that's going to make a change, right. they are sitting in their bedrooms or their office or wherever they are. And they are really upset. And they are saying, gosh, this needs to change. This needs to change. This needs to change. And I think some things do need to change. And th some things people should definitely put a lot of effort into changing. But some things, it's better to work on yourself and your ability to deal with some of those difficulties. Well, I, I, I would argue that by working on yourself, your capacity to lead yep. and affect the change that you want to see is, all, is possible. Yep. You have to do that interior work. You have to do that work in order to be effective at making the world a different place. Yeah, so important. Okay, here's my, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. We're going long. I, my question is, because this is, I think, where the most important part is. Let's just say you've listened to this podcast and you haven't checked out the book yet. And you relate to that feeling we talked about, me at 28, you at 38. Mm. Um, you relate to that lack of connection and sort of meaning and what's going on. And I just feel lost. And what, what would you say that those people should, what's a, what is a step one? Where should they search around to try to find that, you know, what books were for both of us and mm. what should they do when this podcast turns off in a second? Okay. So I, for the answer to that question, I always turn to the poem lost by David Wagner. Mm -hmm. And the first line of which is stand still, stand still. Yep. And that's a command. See, the image is when you're lost in the woods, stand still. What happens for people is when they feel and they connect to that, that sense of being lost, they actually speed up and they do more. Yep. Or they double down on the strategies they've used to get them to where they are. And that doesn't work. So step one is to stand still. And step two is to start to inquire within. Why do I feel the way I do? How, or even more, right? My infamous question that always makes people cry is I ask them, how are you? Mm -hmm. That one question. Because no one tends to answer that question. How am I doing? We're so disconnected from the experience. So step one, stand still. Step two, how am I doing? I'm not well. Okay, what choice do you want to make now? I'd like to feel better. Who can you call, right? And so all of a sudden, it becomes a step-by-step -step progression towards some movement that makes sense, some movement that's going to change your life. Yeah, huge. Jerry, listen, man, I can't thank you enough. And if you can't tell from this conversation, I just, I'm sure you've seen it. I, I'm sure that you're very clear, but your work is making a huge impact on people like me and millions of others that you don't see and, and mm -hmm. that aren't at your boot camps and stuff like that. And man, I just, I can't thank you enough for 
the fact that you have taken what was essentially a jump in front of a train or not moment mm -hmm. and turned it into something so useful for so many people is one of the most, you know, honorable ways to deal with that feeling that I think exists. So I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to hop on and do this with me. Well, and I, uh, you know, let me extend the gratitude to you for reading the book so closely and resonating with it and being honest and authentic yourself and sharing your own reactions to it and inviting me on the show for the conversation. It's been, it's really been a delight. Absolutely. Same here. I will talk to you very soon. And, um, We'll put all the links and everything in the uh, description of the episode here so people know where to find the book and know where to find you. And uh, once again, just thank you, man. Oh, it's, you know, honestly, Chris, I, I didn't know what to expect. I trusted Michael um, and I really enjoyed the conversation. And I just, I, I hope you consider me a friend. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you ever want to come to one of our boot camps or something like that, you just say the word. Yes, I would we'll love to. I will absolutely take you up on that. All right. Thank you, Jerry. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. You got it, buddy. Take All right, care. Take care.